I'd like to thank the co-chairs of the Congressional Mental Health Caucus, Congresswoman Grace Napolitano and Congressman Tim Murphy for sponsoring this briefing today. Greatly appreciate it. So the focus of our briefing today is on the importance and tremendous value of SAMHSA grant programs and what they specifically do to help children with mental health challenges. And we are fortunate to have a packed agenda, so I'm going to launch right into introducing our speakers beginning with Administrator Pam Hyde of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, who will share with us the need for trauma-informed practices in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Next, who will be speaking is Dr. Anthony Manorino, who is the Director of the Center for Traumatic Stress in Children and Adolescents at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, New, uh, Pittsburgh Pennsylvania, rather. And he will explain to us what childhood traumatic stress is and how we can treat it. Next, we will have Christine Marsh, who is a licensed clinical social worker and director of the Child Abuse and Trauma Services in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she'll talk about how her site has been able to integrate trauma-informed practices into their system of care programs in their site. <clears throat> and then finally, we will have Jordan Geddes, who is a youth advocate uh, for the Maryland Coalition for Children's Mental Health. And she'll share her personal story about the trauma that she had in her life and the challenges that, uh, that she experienced, but what services and supports that she received which helped her to ultimately become resilient. First, I'd like to welcome the co-chair of the Congressional Mental Health Caucus, Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, who will explain to you all what some of the work that they've been doing lately with the Mental Health Caucus. Can you guys hear me? Because I... <laughs> Rather than get up and waste a little time here, uh, thank you all of you for coming. Uh, and as you all are aware, May is Mental Health Month, and we're celebrating it by kicking it off with this uh, forum. Um, to be all the community activists, all of the organizations, work together. We need you to raise your voice here in Congress because uh, it is a stigma that keeps everybody from uh, actually putting any face on it. And of course, children don't vote. So we need you to be the voice. We need you to speak up. We need you to inform and educate not only the staff, as well as the member, if you can get a hold of them, but uh, ensure that, you under, that they understand the critical uh, need for funding at the local level, because then you avoid having um, more expenses for the communities, for the nation, uh, as people grow older and are not able to face their, their own uh, uh, trauma. Uh, to Pamela Hyde, thank you for being here. To the panelists, thank you everybody for spending some time with us. Um, we try to address uh, mental health early in my area. We started a program with SAMHSA, thank you very much, uh, in 2000 with the pilot project, which is the basis for uh, my uh, bill, 1851, the Mental Health in School Act. Uh, the teachers tell me they can start at a uh, uh, kindergarten level because they can begin to identify issues that children begin to exhibit at that early age. Uh, my program starts at uh, middle school and then on to high school. Uh, it, uh, so far, it was began in three middle schools and one high school. It is now in 14 schools, 15 and growing. Uh, we haven't lost anybody. It started off with uh, the uh, premise was uh, um, suicide prevention for teen adolescents, but the, the program treats any child. Um, the uh, uh, bipartisan, I'm, I'm sure Tim will come in a little bit later, but we also have uh, on my bill three Republicans and 75 Democrats, and thanks to Tim Murphy, Glenn Thompson, and Steve Austria uh, that are on our uh, bill. Uh, the accomplishments we've uh, been able to have in the last 14 years I've been in Congress is that we have been able to uh, ensure that uh, um, the uh, funding for SAMHSA has uh, maintained at least uh, somewhat more stable than, than even with all the cuts. Uh, from the original 212 uh, million, uh, 27 were only cut, so we saved a few dollars there. Uh, we also had a letter opposing these cuts that was uh, handed not only to our leadership on both sides, but also to uh, the president. Uh, it was a joint caucus letter. Again, I thank you. You don't need to hear me speak, so I will then cut it. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am. I don't like to use the mic actually, but I've had a little bit of a cold, so I'm going to go ahead and use it so make sure everybody can hear. Um, I actually first want to start off by thanking the groups that organized this briefing: the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, Mental Health America, the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I appreciate a whole lot being included in your event and on the panel of such distinguished speakers. Um, especially I appreciate the opportunity to talk about what SAMS is learning and the work that it does uh, with all of you. I also want to thank uh, Congress, the Congressional Mental Health Caucus for its support of this briefing, but also just its general support. And particularly Representative Napolitano, you've been a tremendous champion for mental health, for SAMHSA, for children's mental health issues, and we just can't thank you enough. So. Thank you. Uh, Representative Murphy, who I understand is also uh, going to be here, his firsthand experience and knowledge as a child psychologist has also enabled him to bring a strong understanding of the issues and a passion to improve our nation's behavioral health. So this year, we all celebrate the seventh National Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. And actually, I should just take a moment to appreciate Gary Blau and Lisa Rubenstein and all the staff from SAMHSA wave your hands who've done tremendous work on this and all year long uh, to make this an incredible event. So thank you guys uh, for all that you do. This is a day designed to raise awareness of the importance of promoting positive mental health and the importance of preventing and treating mental health and substance use problems in children and youth. Our national focus this year is on what we're calling Heroes of Hope, the adults who offer a positive and stable long-term influence to help young people thrive and reach their full potential. Heroes of Hope, uh, that supportive adult can have a really large impact on any child's life. One adult can make the difference. And the impact can be particularly important for children and youth who have experienced a traumatic event. These traumatic events can include witnessing or experiencing physical or sexual abuse, violence in families and communities, natural disasters, wartime events and terrorism, <coughs> long-term or multiple deployments of a parent to the military service, accidental or violent death of a loved one, and a life-threatening injury or illness. So there's lots of types of traumatic events. What these events have in common is the ability to affect the daily lives of young children long after the trauma itself has ended, and even into adulthood. For youth who have experienced such events, a hero of hope may be the person in their lives who are the reason that they stay in school, get a good job, stay away from drugs, and become productive, contributing members of their communities, and frankly, be able to handle adversities in adulthood, including uh, potentially mental health issues. One of the first steps to helping a young person is to identify the issues that he or she is having. So today, SAMHSA is pleased to be releasing a new publication titled <coughs> Mental Health and Substance Use Problems of Children and Adolescents, a Guide for Child-Serving Organizations. And one of the unique facets of this guide is that it includes principles that guide screening for mental health and substance use problems developed by a federal partnership. It's the thing that our country and our communities and our Congress people ask of us, and that is to collaborate at the federal level. So this includes many agencies within the United States Department of Health and Human Services, also the United States Department of Education, the Department of Justice's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and the Department of Defense. In addition, the American Academy of Pediatrics reviewed and approved the guide, and it provides detailed information about how to identify mental health and substance use problems very early. It also includes a compendium of appropriate screening tools for children and youth, and in addition, uh, it includes information about early identification, and, um, and the guide also includes sections about highlighting information and resources specific to a number of child-serving settings, including homeless and domestic violence shelters, child welfare settings, juvenile justice settings, early childhood education, primary care, substance use, and mental health settings. We recognize that kids in these settings are um, almost universally going to have experienced traumatic events and need our collective uh, wisdom and help. The guide shows how behavioral health is embedded across all these sectors that serve children. It's important that we screen our young people early, and, and because the earlier we recognize a child's mental health needs, the sooner we can help. 
Early recognition and intervention can actually prevent years of future disability and help children and families thrive. Everyone should learn to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health problems and seek help if they exist. Some of those signs include things like changes in appetite, decreased interest or withdrawal from friends and normal activities, over or under reaction <coughs> to physical contact, sudden movements and sounds, angry outbursts or aggression, a change in sleeping patterns, frequent complaints of headaches, stomach aches or fatigue, avoidance or withdrawing behaviors, heightened difficulty with authority, redirection or criticism, and emotional numbing or expressing no feelings at all. Now for any of us who are parents, we know that sometimes these are descriptions of normal adolescence. <laughs> so making a distinction uh, requires some help and assistance and sometimes we want people to know those signs and symptoms and to know how to ask for help. These symptoms require our attention and they could mean that a child has experienced some type of traumatic event because more than 25% of American youth have experienced such a serious traumatic event by the time they are 16, and sadly, many children suffer repeated and uh, multiple traumas. For a child or youth, traumatic stress can interfere with their concentration and learning and can cause developmental delays. Traumatic stress can lead to problems with mental health, substance use, education, behavior, employment, and other activities of life. And as the number of traumatic events goes up, so too, uh, especially without treatment, do the physical and behavioral health repercussions from depression to alcoholism, drug use, suicide attempts, and even physical issues such as heart and liver disease, as well as social issues such as family, financial, and job problems. So trauma has a financial cost. Uh, we have data that suggests that one type of trauma, trauma child maltreatment, can cost as much as $210,000 uh, in a, a year for a child who's experienced those issues. Evidence also suggests that behavioral health problems put these children and youth at risk for worse behavioral health and physical health problems later in life. And they link frequently to increased risk for obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and a variety of chronic physical health conditions. So we are talking a lot these days about reducing the cost of health care and improving our, our nation's health. We cannot do that without addressing children's mental and emotional health because they have a direct relation to the cost of health care. So we have to be committed to the prevention and treatment of these issues in a public health way. We tend to focus on behavioral health issues as social or moral problems. They are, in fact, a behavioral health uh, and public health uh, problem that we need to address in that way. We have to focus the hearts and minds of parents, providers, and communities and increase the emphasis on behavioral health because the hearts and minds of our children are literally at stake. For children and youth who have experienced a traumatic event, heroes of hope can make a really pivotal, pivotal difference in their lives and help these young people uh, gain, enhance, and demonstrate resilience, which is their ability to successfully adapt to life-changing situations and stressful situations. So SAMHSA is also really pleased today to release some data that shows just how important the impact of Heroes of Hope can be on young people. So we have a short report called Promoting Recovery and Resilience for Children and Youth Involved in Juvenile Justice and Child Welfare Systems. This report looks at children and youth who've been receiving services through a couple of our programs, Comprehensive Community Mental Health Services Program for Children and Families, that's the long title. Uh, we call it the Children's Mental Health Initiative and the Donald J. Cohen National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative, or sometimes we refer to that as NITSI. We use a system of care approach and the organizational philosophy and framework that's used in of CNHI, and it's a proven technology designed to create a network of effective community-based services and supports to improve the lives of children and youth at risk for developing serious mental health conditions, as well as their families. The report contains data from the NITSI, which is the network of SAMHSA grantees from academic, clinical, and community entities that collaborate on evidence-based practices, integrating trauma-informed treatment and practices into all child-serving systems, and promoting effective community programs for children and families exposed to a wide range of traumatic events. So the report that we're releasing looks specifically at children in the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system. These are systems that SAMHSA is partnering with a lot these days 
because the youth in these systems have a higher rate of mental and substance use disorders and are more likely to be exposed to potentially traumatic events and face significant challenges. The short report shows that upon entering our CMHI funded systems of care, 34, almost a, a little over a third of the children in these um, involved in the child welfare system and over a fourth of the children involved in the juvenile justice system had experienced four or more types of trauma um, as they came into those systems. In fact, these children and youth were more likely to have made a suicide attempt as well. 6% of the youth involved in child welfare attempted suicide in the six months prior to entering the CMHI program. Despite those challenges, there's really good news in the report. We know that SAMHSA initiatives help these children and youth build resilience and recover by connecting them with supportive adults, such as Heroes of Hope that we're talking about today, and providing informed, trauma-informed, evidence-based treatment. In many cases, such treatment comes as a result of training received through these grant programs. And among those in these child-serving systems trained, through our National Child Traumatic Stress Network Centers, high proportions of them, in many cases over 80%, report a greater knowledge of child trauma and its impact, a greater knowledge of trauma-focused evidence-based interventions, a greater knowledge of screening and trauma exposure, and a greater knowledge of assessment for trauma exposure. This greater knowledge combined with the actual coming in contact with adults who become heroes of hope is having a decided impact on young people. And just one example is that the children and youth who receive services through both CMHI and our National Child Traumatic Stress Network, for those in the juvenile justice system, they showed a marked decline in law enforcement contacts. Children served in CMHI program and the child welfare system showed a marked decline in suicide attempts. In fact, they were reduced by half from the pre-six months to the uh, beginning six months of going into the program, and within a year, it was down over 80%. So we're literally saving lives in these programs. But I have, I have a picture of them as well. The point here is that every child, every child should have at least one adult who cares enough about them to have their picture in their wallet. That's what we want, heroes of hope, who carry kids' pictures, who care about them, and make a difference in their lives. As we continue to spread the word about the importance of addressing mental health and substance use problems, I and actually invite all of you to consider becoming a hero of hope yourselves, because as the data show, a caring adult is, uh, who is there for a young person and who stays in it for the long haul can make all the difference. Thank you very much. And now next up, we will have Dr. Tony Mandarino. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am uh, truly honored to be here this morning uh, in regard to Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. Uh, I have spent over 30 years in my career dedicated to children's mental health and specifically in regard to the impact of trauma on children and trying to develop effective treatments for children and families exposed to trauma. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network was started in 2000 as part of the Children's Health Act and it is part of the Donald J. Cohen Initiative, Child Traumatic Stress Initiative, which is administered by SAMHSA. The, the, the mission of the CCSN is to advance the uh, and access to care for children and families exposed to traumatic life events. <laughs> that I've been doing this work for well over 20 years. Started doing this. And uh, I the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is the single most important initiative that I've been involved in in my career. It, is, it has advanced the awareness uh, of the impact of trauma on children and the dissemination of evidence-based practice for children and families exposed to trauma in a way that no other initiative that I've ever been involved in in my career. And I would tell you that there are very few things uh, in your professional career that you would describe as a game changer in regard to an area that you work in. 
for the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has been a game changer. For not only the professionals who work in this area, but for children and families exposed to traumatic life events. You can see on the map uh, the programs that are represented uh, by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. There are some that are clustered in the Northeast uh, for programs that were started uh, after the terrorist attack of September 11th. And you also see some cluster programming in the Gulf region as well, which were started uh, after Hurricane Katrina. But a large number of programs scattered throughout the country, including affiliated programs as well. I wanted to acknowledge uh, today uh, the American Psychological Association for its sponsorship of my participation in today's briefing, and an APA's uh, true dedication to bettering the lives of children and families. In fact, I had the good fortune and honor in 2008 to be part of APA's Presidential Task Force on PTSD and trauma in children and adolescents, which really created a number of important educational resources for children and families and professionals who work with children and families exposed to trauma. You know, trauma is sadly, very sadly, embedded in the lives of our children. Um, there are the large national events that we're all aware of, things like September 11, Hurricane Katrina, but there are the everyday events that people don't talk too much about. I'm talking about sexual abuse and domestic violence and physical abuse and community violence and bullying in our schools. And uh, Administrator Hyde mentioned 25% of children experiencing a traumatic event by the age of 16. The sad fact is that most children who experience trauma experience multiple traumas. So we're not just dealing with one traumatic event in their lives, we're often dealing with many, which deeply affects their well-being. So what is traumatic stress? Well, you know, traumatic stress is something that children experience when they're exposed or witness or hear about uh, trauma. But the best way for me to describe what traumatic stress is would be this. Think about our soldiers who have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. We know that something on the order of 20% of our soldiers when they return from combat and being overseas experience post-traumatic stress disorder. We have great compassion for our soldiers who come back with those mental challenges. This is the same kind of issue that many of our children exposed to trauma experience, post-traumatic stress disorder and other traumatic stress symptoms. And uh, not only do they experience changes in their psychology, but there are changes in their underlying neurophysiology as well. It affects their brain development at a very young and vulnerable age. And particularly <coughs> very young children can have very intense reactions. And as I mentioned earlier, trauma is really embedded throughout our society, in our schools, in our families, in our communities. And it's really reached epidemic proportions in our society. There are a range of problems and symptoms that children may experience, and, and really it's, it's the full range of emotional and behavioral disorders that children experience in childhood. But traumatic stress does encompass PTSD and uh, affecting children's ability to relate socially, uh, their ability to do well in school, their ability to have relationships that are constructive. Now, the most important thing, I think, for me to say this morning is this. Without effective identification, without effective assessment of these children, without effective treatment, these children will go into adulthood and be at serious risk for serious psychiatric problems. Mental health difficulties, the potential for suicidality, for depression, overutilization of medical services, Basically, their developmental trajectory is deeply affected by trauma. It changes their course. And without help, it's very difficult to get back on course. The ACEs study that I mentioned on that slide, the Adverse Children <coughs> Experiences study, 
one of the most important studies looking at the long-term impact of adverse traumatic events on children. If you have four or more of these events during childhood, which many of traumatized children have, your, your, your lifespan is short. Can we think of a more dramatic impact than that? That experiencing traumatic events shortens your life and leading to other adverse consequences. So without help, these children are deeply affected. We've had the good fortune in Pittsburgh, uh, our Center for Traumatic Stress in Children and Adolescents. Uh, we started in 1994, and we've been part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network for the past 11 years as a treatment development center. Along with my colleagues, uh, Judy Cohen and Esther Devlinger, we have developed uh, a treatment, an evidence-based practice called Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. We have actually uh, done 12 clinical trials demonstrating the effectiveness of TFCB2. Uh, when children receive this model, and it involves families, their caretakers, we've got evidence to show that 80 to 85 percent of the children and families who participate get marked improvement. Not 100%, but it's, but it's a good start. We've also uh, had the good fortune to disseminate our treatment across the country. We have a web-based course associated with the Medical University of South Carolina. Now, over 120,000 mental health therapists around the world have taken our web-based course. We've also got a train-the-trainer program uh, where trainers have uh, been trained to do TFCBT trainings around the country. In the last three years, our trainers have done over 400 trainings, and 15,000 mental health therapists in America have been trained in this specific evidence-based practice. It's just a slide on the TFCBT web in our web course. The National Child Traumatic Stress Network is all about collaboration. And we've had the good fortune uh, in our participation to work with the Category 3 Community Center sites. Specifically, we've worked uh, with Christine's uh, Family and Children's Services of Tulsa. One of our trainers is located in her center, the 7 TFCBT. We've also been collaborating with the Pennsylvania Systems of Care Grant, which will include trauma-focused training near future, and our, the training coordinator for the Pennsylvania High Fidelity Wraparound as part of the Systems of Care has been part of our Consumer Advisory Board for the past 10 years. I would tell you that um, to see children in our clinic who have been deeply affected by trauma can be very sad. But on the other hand, we also know that the appropriate resources and support that these children can recover. We see most of the children with whom we work recover. I would also tell you that the best thing that's happened in the past 10 or 11 years, and one of the critical things related to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has been the creation of evidence-based practice that effectively helps these children. And secondly, that these evidence-based practices have dissem been disseminated across the country largely because of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. I would tell you also by way of closing that our involvement in the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has facilitated our ability to disseminate our model around the country in a way that no other initiative that we've been involved in ever has. Thank you very much.
and how much that impacts how we serve the children in our agency. We heard Dr. Manorino talk about the NCTSM mission statement, and I have it up here again because I want to highlight how much it is related to the mission statement of my organization. They are interconnected and reliant upon one another. Family and Children's Services became aware of NCTS and SAMHSA funding soon after the inception of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. We became a funded site for the first time in 2003, and from that time on, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network became a core component of our agency's understanding and implementation of trauma-informed care for children and families. We see the map again, and why is this relevant in Tulsa, Oklahoma? There are over 100 centers and members who make up this dynamic network. Oklahoma has greatly benefited from the wealth of these resources, and we have made important contributions back to the network as well. The University of Oklahoma is a member organization. They have taken evidence-based practices and trauma-informed treatment approaches and made them culturally relevant for our Native American population, not only in the state of Oklahoma, but across the United States as well. Our Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, who currently funds our systems of care services, has also looked to the network for guidance in how to also incorporate trauma-informed care for our systems of care recipients. Family and Children's Services works closely with individuals such as Judy, Tony, Esther. I'm calling these folks by their first name because honestly, I have to pull from my head their last name because we know them so well. We also network with Patricia Van Horn out of California, Chandra Bash Giffen out of California. We network with Joy Sofsky out of Louisiana, Robin Gerwich, Joe Benamani out of New York, Charles Wilson out of California, Barbara Bonner out of Oklahoma. A little bit more about family and children's services specifically. We're a comprehensive family and mental health service agency, and we do operate a child trauma center. The outpatient services that we provide are specifically for ages 0 to 18. When I first came to the agency, the age zero was not in our, in our literature. It was not on our books. We did not have clients who were zero years of age. Three, four years of age were much more common. Today, we are serving infants and their parents and families. And over 50% of the children that we serve are ages zero to six. We also are providing family preservation services which is a partnership that we have with our child abuse system in the state of Oklahoma. These services are home-based services, and we are supporting the families who are either at risk of abusing their children or they've been determined to have abused their children. And we recently became a new systems of care wraparound program for children ages 0 to 12 with a specific focus on those who have mental health issues and trauma issues combined. Our goal is to link our systems of care and family preservation services with the trauma-informed practices that we have obtained through our National Child Traumatic Stress Network membership. We serve over 2,000 children specifically in my Child Abuse and Trauma Services Program. Through two SAMHSA-funded grants, our agency has been able to implement three distinct evidence-based trauma-informed treatment models, DSCBT, PCIT, and CPP. Our extensive collaborations and partnerships have been developed at the local, state level, and includes having our own statewide trauma-focused cognitive behavioral training. This has been done in partnership with our Oklahoma Department of Mental Health, as well as our agency and others in the community leveraging private funding so that we can also provide TFCBT training <coughs> to other institutions, such as our therapeutic foster care agencies in Oklahoma. Part of our other collaborations have included participating with our Oklahoma Department of Mental Health, or excuse me, our Oklahoma Department of Human Services and Child Welfare. Our agency is currently participating in a breakthrough series collaborative, helping our Department of Human Services, Child Welfare, learn how to have a trauma-informed system to hopefully provide sustainable placements for our children who are in state custody. Outcomes, we wonder, excellent outcomes. While I don't have the percentage of the percentages of our outcomes here, 
you heard earlier from Tony as well as Pamela, that these children are reducing their trauma symptoms, their attachments are strengthened, their parenting skills are enhanced, and families are being healed. This is one of our visual outcomes. This is from a child who was in treatment with us. This is a seven-year-old little girl who did experience sexual abuse and was exposed to ongoing domestic violence for some time. She was able to report the sexual abuse that she experienced by her mother's boyfriend to her mother. And it, she was able to report it after one incident of sexual abuse, which is very uncommon for the kids that we see. We usually endure abuse for quite some time before being able to report. This mother was able to leave this domestic violence situation place her children into safe housing with her. The children were able to remain with her because of her quick actions and her responsiveness in getting herself, her children, into treatment. What a great outcome this is. So let's talk a little bit more about our systems of care and the growth it's had in Oklahoma. Our Oklahoma Department of Mental Health has leveraged federal and state funding to be able to support our systems of care. They have had two children's mental health initiative cooperative agreements for the systems of care over a 12 year period. And we leverage funding by asking our Oklahoma legislature to match our funding. They have received this match funding for all but one year, which was a specifically economically challenging year for Oklahoma. Some of the outcomes from our systems of care include having a 47% reduction in contacts with law enforcement, a 48% reduction in arrests. 53% reduction in school detentions, 30% reduction in suspensions from school, and a 30% reduction in outcome placements. Having a statewide systems of care is close to fruition for the state of Oklahoma. Our goal now is to be able to take our trauma-informed information, wrap it into our systems of care, so that our families who are receiving systems of care services can have access to evidence-based, promising, trauma-informed practices. We want to be able to provide interventions such as seeking safety, motivational interviewing, child-parent psychotherapy, parent-child interaction therapy, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and many others that the network supports. We're hoping to achieve a combination of excellence by integrating the systems of care and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network information. What has this national collaborative experience meant to us? Well, as Tony mentioned, we do have a national child traumatic, excuse me, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy treatment um, trainer as part of our organization. <coughs> this has been instrumental to the state of Oklahoma. We have been able to partner again with our mental health services and our University of Oklahoma to be able to support and sustain those um, providers in our state in learning TFCBT. We've also been a part of all of the ongoing learning collaboratives within the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which include work groups such as Child Welfare Work, work Group, a Secondary Traumatic Stress Work Group, our Zero to Six Work Group, which focuses on infants and young children, our family and youth involvement. We can't do any of this without input from our families and our youth. And of course, the Sexual Abuse Work Group. So we're looking at the new proven treatments making sure that we have the correct assessments out there. Before we became a member of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, we thought we knew what was going on with some of our families we treated. Until we were able to use the right assessment tools and have the right approaches, we misdiagnosed children. Post-traumatic stress disorder was not on our radar for the young children we served. I personally have diagnosed a two-year-old with post-traumatic stress disorder and never would have done so 17 years ago. We access the webinars through the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, and we promote all of the information and materials that are provided by this network through the state of Oklahoma. Our military families stand to benefit from the work from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network as we prepare to receive many of our service folks back into Oklahoma and help their families reintegrate with one another. So we plan to continue our network connections we plan to have a benefit, not only for ourselves, but to provide information back into the network so that we can all continue to grow. 
we are happy now that we are not asking what's wrong with you, that we can ask what's happened to you. Thank you.
uh, we've got to have people who are not just at the dawn of their career, but at the peak of their career coming in. So that's also my recruitment system. You've seen it all the morning, you've seen it, 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 you uh, just as I recognize in my work before dealing with children with a wide range of problems, I also know there's some areas that was not appropriate for me to treat on that's our professional ethics. And I remind people that look, if you have feelings against the wars, if you have uh, not willing to take the time to learn about a lot of aspects of military jargon, uh, as one soldier told me the third time I have to explain this there, this what an MRAC was, I knew it was time to say goodbye. Uh, or if a person wasn't even willing to understand the difference between but what the good news is, there's a lot of uh, extra training out there, uh, continuing education credits, a lot of people are dedicated to learning this stuff. Good, keep, keep doing it. But when it comes to children, um, your efforts to continue to focus and make sure we're out there doing the right thing, giving guidance to Congress, you know, what we can be doing, the one way to facilitate it, that is so important. When you're dealing with a $16 trillion debt, a lot of people say we've got to make cuts, and yes, we've got to make serious cuts. So the explanations you have while you're here is how to continue to fund things that saves money. Let me leave you with this little lesson how this it works. We have to rely on something called the Congressional Budget Office when bills come through, and they tell us that they're going to cost. And I know this is an ongoing frustration for us here in Congress when we can't even say, oh, well, if you do this, it's going to cost money, right? It's just even though we know early treatment saves money. The Congressional Budget Office calls that dynamic scoring. They said, you can't prove it's going to save money, so we're going to say it's cost. So you have to come armed with lots of research and lots of studies to say, this is how it actually saves money. This is how we should show you this is worthwhile spending with the return of 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1. Now, it's our job then, a great mind job, to say, OK, well, we have to somehow convince colleagues but the Congressional Ball Budget Office, they still come back and say, no, spending, you can't prove it's going to save money. We have to really be well armed with great research to help, help us help the world overcome. Together on that, that's our mission. All right, okay, excellent. Um, let's keep working together. Let's get these things done for the sake of the country, for the sake of our next generation. And thank you for our hard work.
totally gone. Stay away from the night. Didn't want to do anything. I don't make sports. I don't think I was in two. And I uh, remember I heard saw this. And they put in these services. And I guess we're going to see the therapy services. I don't have any trust. But the school didn't want to do anything because it was very smart. It was tested really high and never really went to school. And, and uh, so, so I set up my mental health issues for competing my school works. So, It got bad enough that at the end of my eighth grade year, I tried to drop myself. And when I'm in the hospital the first time, they changed all of my medications. I learned about self injury. And then I left a week later with all the medications and new coping mechanisms, which wasn't exactly um, And things got really bad that summer. And by the time I entered high school the next year, uh, I was uh, in the first one almost every day. Uh, I was hopeless. And I started a school where I still had no services um, because I was intelligent, so why do I need services? And uh, I had been put on a medication that made me gain, over the course of the next two years or so, 120 pounds, makes you 300 pounds because of the medication. So, and then, so, then, so I guess I go to the doctor and have him tell me that I need to do as much exercise. Um, and, and I'm in a school full of a couple thousand kids and I can't talk to them. I would go weeks without talking to anybody at school. I felt so disappointed and tried to put myself in. And it came fairly close to the to last thing I was in my mother. Um, and I was in the hospital for six months. I ended up getting electric shock therapy. I was one of the first, uh, um, first people on their team to, to, to have that since the 60s. Um, but it actually helped. I started feeling better. Was happier and I went to a <coughs> school in um, Connecticut. You know, my parents got to the school and paid for that. I went there and they were specifically for you to open a hall pop and see your grade and I got kicked out and got sent back to Maryland and I sent her to a residential facility, which was probably a piece of work. It didn't help anything, it felt so much worse. And finally, my parents always come in and took me out there. And I was to it. School that was uh, not a not a regular school, but better way for for you to know things. And you see, the next few years, I was in the East, a better person, a better person, a better person. Part of the big problems was that I had a therapist at school, I had a therapist in Baltimore, I had a psychiatrist, I had a nutrition, I had, and I had school things, and no one actually talked. One really important so um, it was almost it was just coming kind of across in the sea of different kinds of treatments and multiple really different things. And and I and I didn't know how to deal with things like that. I didn't know how to deal with being bullied by or my little school and being outcast and feeling horrible <coughs> and or, or what it would happen in the same place and same place as I was sent to our and things that worse and worse and worse. And finally I was sent to by such a center for my entire community. It was actually a very good center, um, very good presidential center. Um, and, and for the first time, it was all of my sources were kind of more important. I had my therapists and psychiatrists and teachers and, and people who I lived with actually talk for a while. So, and, and, uh, and, and I had one shooting plan, and I started to do a lot better. And I actually graduated high school with a little better. And then I graduated, and the day after I graduated, you know, and it was like, all, all of a sudden, all that support, all that, all that help, all that, all that treatment plan, and everything I was going to do was gone. And the plan was, was I'm smart, so I'm going to go to college, I'm going to go to community college, I'm going to go to community college, I'm going to go to my whole classes. And I was so terrified by all those students that I had. And I was in, uh, I was thinking that a halfway house, um, kind of, it was a halfway house kind of program for transition which is youth that just seems to And, uh, and things just got worse and worse. And then about a year later, I tried to come myself again. And I went to the hospital. I was in the hospital for a total of about three months. And I was kind of went from hospital to the hospital to the program. My, but when I first went in, my parents finally told me, you know, we need to work with ourselves, we need to, to, to fix the things. And, uh, and 
to you know, cut off contact. So, and, and by the program's office, I uh, decided that I wasn't, um, that they couldn't help me, that, 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 that I was too high risk. And, and I'm applying and sending me to Spring Grove, which is a hospital that basically, when you go there, you're there, you're there. And yeah, I came from a normal childhood, a normal elementary school experience. I have a loving family. I, I, I'm intelligent. You know, I had friends. I played soccer. And and here I am, 18 and a half, and about to be sent to a lifelong institution. Um, and that's been really amazing that happened. Um, I started to get better. And the question I get asked more than anything else in the lab that I've seen with you is what happened. What, told you, what changed? And there were really two things that I look at and I look back and say, this, this, this is what helped, this is, this is what changed for me. One of them was that I had, I had some, uh, Christine Trucker was the head of uh, the program I was in, and her job was really just kind of like, was just the case manager, it was kind of for you, formal stuff. But she became, she became a, a, a kind of a mentor, and she, and she was that one person that was, that linked me, to my own situation, to my therapist, to my psychiatrist, to my family, to the school, to everything. It was the <coughs> first time not being like in an actual prison, but not just something that had that, I had that connection, which is uh, what the community more helps me. And so, so that was huge for me. She was there for me. The other thing is, I finally started dealing with a lot of things that had happened to me that the bullying and the, and the persecution and the, and the Stuff that happened in some of the places I was sent to, uh, um, that, that I had never been able to deal with before. I finally started dealing with things like getting more and facing and dealing with the consequences yeah. and how that affected me. That I wasn't, didn't know that I was a bad person, you know, that, I had, that I had these going with because of that. You know. um, and those are probably the two hugest things for me. But I kind of lucked out when I got that. And like I said before, at the time that the that, that doctor system, we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have systems of care. Which is huge, which does amazing. We, there were trauma centers, but really, that wasn't really an option. And the president center that, that I graduated from, we had 40 students. And when I say that I am not, I am not the rule. I'm the exception as far as getting better before these services. I mean, because out of all the people I know from who graduated, I know of five that are pregnant. That got pregnant within a year of leaving. I know several that are in jail, I know several that are dead, I know several that are still in the system of blood wounds for the rest of their lives. And these are kids who are like me, who, I mean, like, not means, so, so some of them came from, like, mature environments, but a lot, uh, a lot of them came from similar backgrounds that, 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 that I did. You know, like, smart kids that could have done amazing things and, and could be here standing where I am speaking to you, but they aren't because I kind of lucked out that I got those, that extra support when I needed later. And, uh, I mean, and it does. It, 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 it saves lives, and it, and it helps. It gives it gives someone a chance to get better, to do what they're meant to do. And I mean, I'm doing every single thing I should now. I've been doing for years. I've I've worked at companies. I've testified in Annapolis on bills. I'm probably the current major in college. <laughs> <laughs>
talk to them, inform them, and educate them. Because if you don't, then it makes our jobs harder because there is no money that anybody wants to put out unless there's somebody pushing. Thank you very much. Thank you.